Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, professor, by the way, I'm uh, Yimin Wen. I'm a uh, systems manager, research group here with Google Information Management, Security Management. And we're very interested in DEM based security. That's why I uh, have uh, Peter Chen to come and visit us today. He's a associate professor in the Department of uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. His research interests include operating system, computer security, and fault tolerant computing. His current research applies and extends virtual machine technology to computer forensics and security. He's addicted to teaching. <laughs> Maybe you could hold the writing as well? Uh, no. no? Okay. That's more of a bondage, not addiction. So, we'll talk about a virtual machine approach. <laughs> Thanks, Yiming. Uh, I don't think there's any amplification on this, which I don't think I should need in a style room like this, but I, I assume it's being, um, it's, I said it's on, so I assume it's being mic'd to some other location unwittingly to me. All right. Well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my, I think if I took a survey in the people in this room, and I'm not going to, so don't worry, but if I did, my guess is that uh, many of the people here, including myself, um, have had our computers broken into at some point. Now, uh, you might protest a bit, uh, um, so let me define what I mean by a computer intrusion. Uh, I include in that the classic kind of intrusion. For, for example, you have a vulnerable network service running and somebody hacks into your computer over the network, right? the classic kind. Um, I'm also including less classic kinds, like perhaps somebody emailed you a Word document that had a macro virus in it, or perhaps you unwittingly clicked on an email attachment that you shouldn't have and infected yourself with a virus. Uh, or perhaps uh, uh, you were browsing some website and downloaded some software and you got some spyware on your computer, right? Any of those I'm going to consider a computer intrusion because all of those allow somebody else to be running software on your machine that you don't really want it to have there, okay? Now, if you've had this happen, then you'll know that some questions come into your mind when you discover the fact that you've been intruded upon. Questions like, well, gee, how did it happen? Uh, what did they do after they got into my machine? And how can I clean up, right? And those are the kind of questions that form the basis of the field of computer forensics, answering those kinds of questions. And in, uh, in this talk, I'm going to give a, an overview of um, a bunch of the work we're doing at Michigan with regard to computer forensics. And I hope to convince you that virtual machines are a great tool to use for answering those kinds of questions. Um, as I said, the uh, field of computer forensics has to do with answering these kinds of questions, um, really two categories. One is, you know, how did they get in? Was it a local user who was doing something they shouldn't have? escalating their privilege? Was it a remote user breaking into my computer uh, through the firewall or something? Okay. Um, which application was it that allowed the um, privilege escalation or exploit in the first place? Um, and once they got in, what do I do about it? You know, what did they do about it in the first place? Um, you know, did they steal some data? Did they modify some data that they that I thought was secure but now is no longer secure? We had an incident in Michigan where a student broke into a computer and changed his grade. Um, <laughs> He's great on an exam, and had the nerve to come back and complain that his letter grade didn't match the numeric grade, uh, <laughs> and that's when we caught him. <laughs> so he was uh, nervy, but not very intelligent, I guess. Um, you know, did they did they uh, add some kind of backdoor to allow you them to break into the computer again more easily the second time? Uh, did they use your computer as a launching pad against other computers? Right? Um, any of these things are possible. I think it's obvious why we care about this. Uh, you know, we we want to know at least how they got in, so we can prevent them from getting in again. Right? Uh, and we, might, we probably want to know what they did so we can repair what they've done. Uh, there may even be some legal liability involved if they use our machine as a launching pad against other machines. I got a call from University of Indiana once uh, saying, hey, did you know your computer is attacking our computer? Uh, and that's actually when I started entering into the field of security. I thought, you know, I've got to do something about this. Um, okay. And forensic also sometimes has to do with uh, prosecution of, of criminals and stuff. I'm not really going to talk about that so much, but that's also in play here. Uh, so I thought I'd illustrate this, the state of the art by a couple of ways. One is to uh, talk about a story that happened to me when I was at Michigan a couple of years ago. Uh, we got an email from our system admins uh, who said, everybody must change their passwords right away. Uh, well, th that's the kind of message you don't ignore. Uh, uh, you know. And so, of course, I changed my password. But being naturally a curious person, I went up to the fourth floor in our building to our system admin's office, and I said, uh, you know, hey, what's going on? 
They said, well, what happened was uh, the reason you changed your password was somebody has Trojan horsed the SSH client on uh, a bunch of servers. Now, if you know SSH, you know that that is really bad because SSH client is where you type your passwords in. So it's trivial for them to get your passwords if they replace the SSH client binary. So I said, well, that's really bad. Um, by the way, how did they get in to change the SSH client in the first place? And they said, well, uh, we think that uh, they got into a hole in the, a bug in the Linux kernel. And uh, I said, oh, very interesting. Uh, what makes you think that? And they said, well, what happened was um, they broke in. Uh, we found out about it. We, uh, we, we, we put back the right uh, SSH client, and we patched all our applications, and we brought the machine back up. A couple days later, they broke in again. So we took the machine down, repeated the repair procedure, and this time we patched the kernel as well as the applications. Um, and they haven't broken in since. <laughs> and uh, I was like, that doesn't make me feel very good about you guys. I mean, it doesn't really sound like you really understood the bug. It sounds like you're guessing about what happened. At best, you have circumstantial evidence that you fixed the bug, right? I mean, maybe they just got bored and stopped bothering to attack you. Or maybe they're still attacking you and they've gotten smarter so you didn't detect it this time, right? Uh, you really don't know. And the problem here is not that the sysadmins at Michigan are incompetent. They're actually pretty good. The problem is that they just don't have the right tools to work with to properly understand the intrusions. And that's what forensics is about here. Okay? Um, I think there's at least four problems with computer forensics. Uh, I'm going to go over them quickly because I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground in this talk. Um, the first problem is integrity. And by that, I'm talking really about the integrity of the data used to do the forensics. Right? Forensics is all about logging some data and then analyzing it later. The problem is that the, the, the software that logs the data is generally implemented in user land or perhaps in the kernel. If it's in user land, it's trivial to disable. Right? Any, any attacker worth his or her salt is going to disable it as soon as they break in. So people have been putting the logging software in the kernel instead, figuring that it's harder to disable that, which it is, but it's still not that bad. And the reason is the kernel itself, um, even if there's a strict separation between admin privileges and kernel privileges, um, the kernel itself is not a very good trusted computing base. It's just too big uh, and too complicated. Um, there's been studies showing you know, numerous uh, security-related vulnerabilities, um, even in uh, pretty secure software. And so um, because of that, once the attacker breaks in, they turn off the logging software. And now, once they do that, you really have no information to analyze in the forensics space. In the worst case, they actually erase old log records. That's really bad. But assuming you wrote it to some kind of write once medium, they can't do that. But at least they can um, uh, prevent you from taking new log records. They can, or maybe even worse, add misleading log records in there. And the problem is because the kernel, which is where the best place is to log right now, um, is just not a very good trusted computing base. Second problem is completeness. And um, by this I mean, you know, how complete is your log information? Does it enable you to answer questions about the attack? Um, if you read reports on analyses of attacks, you'll see that they're filled with uh, disclaimers like, it looks like this happened, uh, this might have occurred, and these steps we surmise must have happened because of this evidence. They don't really have complete information. Really, if you read between the lines, they're saying, if only we knew this, we could understand the attack much better. Right? They're fundamentally incomplete. And it's not surprising, because if you think about it, it's a very hard problem. You're trying to predict before the attack, how to analyze the attack. Right? And yet, you haven't predicted the attack itself. Otherwise, you would have stopped it, presumably. Right? So you're trying to predict what you need to analyze an unpredicted attack. And that's just kind of hard. Right? Um, so you might say, well, we'll just log everything. But it's not immediately clear what everything is. Uh, you might think, for, network, for remote attacks, well, we'll just log every network packet. And uh, that's been suggested and done before. But that's also not complete. For one thing, the response of the system to the network packets may be non-deterministic. And that's typical, for example, if you're exploiting some kind of race condition on the server. Right? Its response is non-deterministic. So logging the input does not tell you exactly how the system responded. And in fact, those are often the kinds of bugs that linger in systems for a long time, are these non-deterministic race conditions, time of check, the time of use kinds of bugs. Um, more fundamentally, if uh, any kind of non-internism really causes problems here. For example, uh, at Michigan, we had a project called Packet Vault, not in my organization, but um, they were just trying to log all the network packets for exactly this reason, to, to go back and analyze the attack afterwards. What they found was that the attackers tended to use encrypted network traffic. 
And so they couldn't decrypt the input that they had. They had saved gigabytes and terabytes of it, but it was all useless to them. So they modified their system to fix this problem. They didn't bother saving encrypted network packets at all. Right. <laughs> all right, so that's the second problem. Third problem um, is uh, that forensic tools tend to be rather ad hoc. Um, they require a lot of expertise to use and a lot of guesswork. They're very manual. Um, I don't know how to quantify this, but I thought what I'd do is I'd quote from the CERT Best Practices Guide to, to kind of illustrate just how bad it is here. Um, so I figured if anybody knows how to do this, CERT should know how to do this, right? They're the center for this kind of stuff. So this is how they suggest recovering from a compromise, uh, of which forensics is one step. Let's say, okay, first look for tools and data left behind by the intruder. Um, now that's actually fine advice, uh, assuming the intruder reads it. Um, but uh, it's not at all clear, um, you know, what do you do if the intruder uh, didn't obey this advice and uh, let's say practice good hygiene and clean up after himself. There may be no tools and data left behind by the intruder except for the, you know, the, the, the tatters of your, of your system. Um, but let's take it for what it's worth and say, okay, we'll look for that. Well, where did we look for it? Okay. Well, CERT has some good advice. They say, okay, look for unexpected ASCII files and slash dev. Uh, I guess this is a Unix document for this part of it. Um, well, again, that's, uh, that's good advice. Uh, I hope the attacker leaves some good ASCII files for me to look at in <laughs> slash dev. Um, but uh, it, even if this, you know, you say unexpected. Um, what does that mean? That means something that a human did not expect. That means that the one looking is a human. Right, manual ad hoc analysis, right? Um, then we say, well, we don't only tell you where to look, but we tell you how to look. Look very carefully. Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I guess I needed that advice. Uh, and they say look for hidden files and directories, things like uh, names like uh, space or dot, something like that, right? Something that's hidden. Um, and the, the final thing is look for anything that appears out of the ordinary. Uh, and again, that's really advice that really can only be followed by a human. I mean, we have anomaly detection, but out of the ordinary generally is for human beings to follow. And Notice it says, when you're doing log files, right? Which log files? All log files? That's a lot of data for a human being to look through, right? So we'd like to fix that. Fourth problem is uh, uh, intrusion detection. And this is only somewhat tangentially related to computer forensics. But the two are related because forensics starts when intrusions have been detected. If you haven't detected something, you don't really know to do a forensics phase in the first place. Okay? And actually, it's synergistic. Not only do you start with intrusion detection and then go to forensics, you can start with, for, after you do forensics, you can go back and improve your detector. Right? That's what virus companies and stuff do. Right? They analyze intrusions, like semantic, whatever. They analyze intrusions, they understand them, and then they construct new signatures and install them as new detectors so that other computers can also detect them before they get infected. Okay? So that's, that's the way things are supposed to work. But they don't always work this way. For example, imagine that you have discovered a, imagine that a, dis, a vulnerability has been discovered in some software. Okay? Um, eventually that's going to get patched. That's fine. And eventually this cycle will take over and, and you will install the patch for your vulnerability and um, the firewall company will install a new detector for this virus or a shield for it. Right? will detect, will um, install something that will stop the virus or stop the attack from coming in. But that doesn't do anything about the attacks that occurred before the vulnerability was discovered. It only protects you from the future on. Okay? And so if, if you've been attacked sometime in the past, you don't know about it, and you don't know to run a forensics tool for it. Okay? So those are four problems, or maybe three and a half problems with computer forensics. And in this talk, in half an hour, I'm going to try to address all of these, uh, at least a little bit. Uh, I'm, going to skim, I'm really going to skim the top of, of a lot of different talks. Uh, I'm happy to go into more detail in our one-on-one -on -one times or uh, Q&A or over lunch. Um, I figure you only listen to the first 10 minutes of a talk anyway, so I'm going to give you three talks, the first 10 minutes of three talks instead. All right, so the first problem, if you remember, was lack of integrity. And the way we solve that, in general, in our project, um, our project is called Covert. Um, VIRT stands for virtual machine. Uh, and the idea is that we're going to use virtual machines as a better trusted computing base, better than the kernel. I think you all know what virtual machines are, but just so we're talking the same language, um, you start with a normal machine, which has normal software running on it. And then you take all the software running on the machine, and you hoist it up a layer, and you insert a new layer of software called the virtual machine monitor underneath it. Okay? Now, uh, to that virtual machine monitor, I'm going to add security services. And I argue that those, that is a very good layer to add security services, 
better than the kernel because um, I believe that this layer is relatively small and simple compared to this layer. Okay? Now, it's not just because uh, you know, the people doing programming for virtual PC and VMware are better programmers or more concise programmers. That's not it. There are actually fundamental reasons why this layer is smaller. And the reason is it's doing less. If you think about it, what the OS is doing is it's transforming an interface of hardware to, in, to the um, system call interface uh, that the operating system gives to the, its applications. Right? That's a fairly complicated transformation. It involves things like file systems, for example, network protocols, et cetera, et cetera. Right? In contrast, this is doing very little work. All it's doing is it's transforming an interface, which is hardware, to an interface that looks exactly the same, except it's partitioned. Right? It's adding no new abstractions, so it's doing less work, so it's smaller. Not surprising. Okay? In addition, these interfaces tend not to change very much. Okay? And so um, the virtual machine monitor can be more stable than the operating system, and, uh, and thus it's easier to audit over a longer period of time, and you can have more assurance for it. Okay? That's the idea. Um, now, we're going to use um, this virtual machine monitor to add our logging software so that even if the operating system itself is broken into and completely compromised, wiped out, boot sector replaced, um, yet still we can log below it. And unless they break into the virtual machine monitor itself, um, we can still understand their actions. That's the idea with covert. Okay? And that's how we attack the integrity problem. Um, the second problem was completeness, and I will spend a little more, a little more time on this. Um, we're going to attack completeness by um, a project we call Revert. And Revert's aim is to provide fundamentally, absolutely comprehensive, complete information about the attack. What do I mean by this? Um, by all the information, what I mean is I want to know the entire state of the machine, of the virtual machine, the registers, all the memory, all the disk blocks. Anything that the software can see, I want to reconstruct. That's complete. And I want to know this at every instant in time over, over a long period of time. And when I say every instant in time, I mean every instruction. So I want to get, give you the entire state of the machine at every instruction boundary over months. Okay? Um, and I argue that if I provide this, you will have complete information to analyze the attack. Right? You have all the information that the software that was originally running had, so that must be enough information. Okay? Now, usually when I talk about this, the reaction is, that sounds like a lot of information, uh, doesn't it? Right? Billions of instructions per second, uh, you know, gigabytes of memory, hundreds of gigabytes of disk. You want to provide that at every instant in time over months? That doesn't seem realistic. And the surprising thing is, is actually we can do this at very low overhead, both space and time. And, um, and actually we can do it with well-known techniques. So the, the fault tolerance community, um, which Yiming and I both hail from from time to time, um, uh, knows how to do this. And we can simply apply these known techniques to the problem of computer forensics. Uh, so the basic idea is you start from a checkpoint of your virtual machine. Um, so that includes the disk, the memory, and the registers. Okay? And that's big, although we have some ways of making that smaller too, based on copy and write and stuff. But let's see, just take a check checkpoint. Okay? Now, to get to the next state, let's say the register is pointing at a certain instruction. Like the program counter is pointing to whatever, an add instruction. Well, if I, if I roll the clock forward one cycle, then I will re-execute that instruction, and I will transform it from the initial state that I've checkpointed to the next state that I had the last time. The same next state, because add is deterministic. Right? And not only is add deterministic, almost all instructions are deterministic. Right? Intel wouldn't get very far if they produced a non-deterministic architecture. It'd be very hard to program on if you got different results every time. So most of their instructions are deterministic. And because of that, you don't have to log anything to recreate the second state, or the third state, or the fourth state, or the fifth state. Okay, you can recreate all these states just from the initial state and rolling the clock forward, just as the initial machine did. Now, there are some things that you do have to log because they're not deterministic. Things like keyboard input has to be logged. After all, I don't want to have to ask the attacker to please key in the same keystrokes that he did the first time. All right? uh, so we save those and we replay those. But that's tiny. I mean, how fast can you really type? Right? Um, mouse input's the same. Uh, the one big thing that could be uh, fairly large is network input. So we do have to solve, uh, we do have to save the incoming network traffic. Although we have some ideas about how to avoid doing that also if it's between a machine that, you, if, if the communication is from a machine that you also are running revert on. You can basically ask it to replay itself and regenerate the traffic. But 
even without that, um, you can uh, log all this external input, and it's actually not that big. Note, by the way, that hard disk reads are not logged, because that is fairly big, and because we don't need to. If we start from a checkpoint in the disk and replay all the writes to the disk, it's also going to deterministically replay the same results to its reads. Right? So we don't have to log that. Um, the one somewhat tricky thing we do have to log are interrupts. So not only is the data that comes in non-deterministic, the time of certain events is non-deterministic, in particular the, the, you know, the point, of, the point of, that was interrupted. So we have to log that time. And not just the rough time that the interrupt happened. We need to know exactly which instruction was interrupted. Okay? Because that might eff affect uh, the race conditions of the program. And we can do this through, uh, through an observation that, uh, it's, to start with, you can think about logging the value of the program counter of the, at the interrupt. And that you have already in the interrupt handler, of course, because you have to know when to resume, where to resume the interrupt. So you have the program counter value already. That's a pretty good start. It's not unique because, uh, you know, the same instruction could occur multiple times in your stream. So you have to differentiate between multiple occurrences of the same instruction. But you can do that fairly easily by observing that between any two instances of the same program counter value, there must be a backward control transfer. Right? There must be some kind of branch or jump or something. And you can, you can count the number of branches and jumps um, using Pentium um, performance counters. So the tuple program counter, comma, number of branches or control transfers is a unique identifier for the point in the instruction stream. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear the question. That's roughly it, yeah. Um, that's actually, if we could do it that way completely, but it would be somewhat slow if you had a tight loop, because you have to break on every instruction there. Uh, so what we do is we actually, um, the branch counters have an overflow. They can, they can basically count down to a certain number and then um, give you an interrupt. If we did it with the breakpoint? Break yes, yes, yes. It would, yes. Yeah, that, that's true. Although you could then use hardware, hardware breakpoints. All right. We actually do do it. Um, in this, we actually get it pretty close using the performance counters, and then we and then we single step or single breakpoint at a time to do that. All right. So current PC hardware allows us to do this. Um, and as I said, uh, the overhead is fairly low for a variety of benchmarks, uh, ranging from completely compute bound local to a more system call bound to network stuff to interactive stuff. Overhead is uh, less than ten percent for logging. And uh, in terms of space overhead, it ranges from practically zero for the local benchmarks to maybe a gigabyte or so a day for any kind of network intensive file server, web server kind of workload. This is not Yahoo web server or MSN. Or, you know, this, is, this is kind of a, web, uh, you know, a local web server that we have just running spec web. Um, but even so, it's a like gigabyte a day. That's uh, maybe 50 cents or so a day. And uh, that means that on a single hard drive of, say, 100 or 200 gigabytes, you could store enough information to be able to replay the whole attack over three or four months. Okay? And with that, you can replay to an arbitrary level of detail, um, arbitrary attacks, even if they compromise the operating system kernel, since the logging is taking place below the operating system. Uh, replay occurs at about the same speed as the original run, which is not surprising given that we're replaying by re-executing the original run, so it's at the same speed. Um, we do actually sometimes uh, get a lot faster than the original run, and that we don't have to replay idle time. We just skip over that. Um, and so the, the grad student that was running this desktop workload um, apparently had 97% idle time on his processor. Uh, maybe I should pay him accordingly, 3% or something. Um, uh, <laughs> That's true. Uh, this, is, this is running user mode Linux. Not the best VMM to use, but we had source code for it. Yeah, Jay? Is there something that the hackers can do? Is there, are there particular instructions they can run that will cause the space overhead to be particularly high so that they try to run without a problem? Well, most, so that's possible, of course. You can have a denial service attack like that. Um, well, you, you know, try to overflow your right, log. Right, right. So two answers for that. One, actually, it's not that easy. You, you could, of course, blast us with network traffic. But you could have done that without revert anyway. So um, the, there's not actually that many non-deterministic instructions around. Uh, it's really interrupts that are the main thing. 
And so um, I, I don't know how they could generate a lot of interrupts other than by generating a lot of I.O. or something. Right. Uh, reading the clock would do it, yes. That would cause us to have uh, much higher overhead in logging. But actually, we'd like it if they did that, because that's the very telltale sign that there's something wrong in your computer. <laughs> right. So if they're too obvious in how they try to disable your logging, uh, it becomes just a, a you know alert to something's wrong. So they probably don't want to do that, actually. OK. Um, so I'm going to show a demo of revert running, just because it's fun. Um, let me start it up, and then I'll explain it. So um, this is the console of a virtual machine. The virtual machine is running in this little box here, um, which is a little demo PC we bring around. Um, this is just Linux booting up. Um, this box is running um, UML, using more Linux. And this is the virtual machine that's booting up um, inside of it. And you can see it booting up. And uh, I just started the X server, in case you're wondering. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a run. I'm going to I'm going to you know do a new run as if I were an attacker, and then I will replay it, and you'll see if the demo works. Um, every, everything being replayed the same way as it did before. Okay. So I'm going to start up the window manager here. Um, it's running an old version of Red Hat. Sorry. Um, and uh, let me just start up a terminal and do some stuff that an attacker might do. So first, before I do that, just so you can see it more easily, I'm going to um, make the font a little bigger. Um, also, this will show you that, uh, that it's replaying the window manager interactions as well. So even this stuff will be replayed exactly as it was before. All right. Now, an attacker, or even just a normal user, um, might do various things. Some are very easy if they just you know, list the contents of the directory. That's deterministic. That doesn't take any, any work to do. Right? Um, they might do something non-deterministic like, uh, you know, look at the time. That changes from time to time, right? Um, or they might do something really hard, like generate a new encryption key. So this is a new encryption key that's been generated. It's been generated based on local entropy gathered in the system, right? Non-deterministic keystrokes and who knows what else they're measuring. Um, and they generate the encryption key, and, and here's, the, um, here's the key fingerprint, which I'd like you to memorize if you can. Uh, and if you can't do the whole thing, then just remember the last two digits. Um, and just so you can check to make sure that it's, it's going to regenerate the same key that it did the first time. And just to show you if there's nothing up my sleeve, uh, we can do it again, and, and we will get a different, a different key, probably. Right? <laughs> and that's uh, 6B, so 936B. All right. Now let's see the attacker starts getting nervous. Uh, he's being watched. So he says, OK, I'll, I'll remove everything on your system, uh, and, uh, and the system will <coughs> gradually keel over and die here. I'm not going to let it die all the way, although it will eventually just hang. Um, if you move all the files, that tends to happen. Um, all right, so that's now dying, and I'm just going to kill it um, from outside. So um, now, the, now the run's done, and I'm going to um, replay it. Um, so it's actually booting up the same way as before. I realize you can't really tell that that's true, um, although if you really, really were observant, you'd see that there was a date in here being, being written somewhere. Uh, and the same date will actually get, get um, pumped out the next time. Uh, but I can't catch that most of the time either. Oh, there it is. There it is. The date. Um, so it's just booting up normally. And this time, I don't have to type any input whatsoever. It's just going to replay by itself. Um, I will bring up the um, X window to show you the output being regenerated. This time, I actually failed when I gave it to the funding agency once because I had the wrong version of software installed. It was really embarrassing. Uh, hopefully, I won't do that again. All right. So um, it's now re re restarting. Um, and again, I don't have to type any input um, it, because I've logged the input as well as I've logged all the non-determinants in the system, which means it'll regenerate um, all the actions that I did the last time, including font changes and stuff like that. And here's my, um, here's my keys, 9.3 and 6b. And, and it's going to re remove all those files again. Right? And it will re-die in the same way. Okay? Um, and at any point, if I wanted to, I could stop it. Um, and then I could log in and tool around and look around. All the state's been recreated. Um, I need to start the second demo, um, just because it takes a little bit to get to the right point uh, for the time of the talk. But this will just take 10 seconds. All right. You guys are welcome to ask questions uh, in the middle. I, I, I think you already feel like that, but yes. 
That is a great question. Um, we're working on it. Um, the reason that, uh, so that's a very insightful question. The reason we don't work for multiprocessors right now is we're trapping interrupts, which means that the, um, we're, we're figuring out when you switch processes. Multiprocessors make that much harder because you don't actually switch processes. You don't switch, right? Or maybe if you do, it, it's at a very high frequency. So what we're going to try to use is um, techniques um, similar to distributed shared memory, where we're trying to keep them consistent. Uh, and we're going to figure out um, you know, when, you have, when you touch shared pages, we'll try to replay the interactions there. Or uh, maybe a more disgusting way of putting it is we're going to take a perfectly good shared memory multiprocessor and turn it into a cluster, or something as bad as a cluster. We're not sure this will, we're sure this will work. We're pretty sure this will work. But we're somewhat doubtful that it'll be fast, right? Uh, but it's worth trying. So. Uh, there actually is work in the hardware community. Um, Mark Hill and his students did a, something called Flight Data Recorder, um, which is a way of doing uh, um, this much faster. Um, Hyperthreading is basically a, a poor man's multiprocessor, so it has the same problems. We're, not, we're assuming no processor bugs because we're only replaying the software. Um, but if the stepping is different, um, as long as the software doesn't depend on that, that's okay. If the software does a CPU ID instruction, we're out of luck because that's going to return a different result. Although we're working with Intel um, and the Vanderpool stuff, and um, I think they're actually allowing us to trap the CPU ID instruction now with the VMS extensions. So, but in general, yes, you ought to replay it on the same hardware, or at least the same hardware as visible to the software. Other questions? Okay. Yeah, multiprocessors are a weakness. There's no question. Um, of course, we can replay. A, we can do a multiprocessor if you turn off all but one processor, right? or if you use them for diff for separate virtual machines. And that's a perfectly viable approach, right? You say you have a multiprocessor. I run one multiple sh virtual machine on each processor, so I have a virtual. I still have a, a set of virtual uni processors, and I can replay each virtual uni processor, and that would be perfectly acceptable, I think. But we're working on it. All right. Now, Revert gives you some interesting capabilities. Right? You can analyze any intrusion to any level of detail. Now let's look at how you analyze intrusions, because Revert isn't by itself an intrusion analyzing tool. It enables intrusion analysis tools. Right? It enables any intrusion analysis tool that could have run live, because you're replaying and you have the same information as you had live. Okay? And the nice thing is that you can, re you can create the tool lazily. You can log the attack using Revert, and then you know you have all the information you could ever want. And then you can go back and create a tool to process that execution. You don't have to anticipate the kind of tool you'll need until after the attack. And that's kind of nice. And in fact, we've used that many times. You know, we put up honeypots and log their execution, and then we create tools to analyze them, like Backtracker. Um, there's two styles of tools that you can imagine. One one type of tool runs inside the virtual machine itself. It runs on top of the virtual machine's operating system, the guest operating system. And um, that's very convenient because the guest operating system already provides nice abstractions for you. So I could stop the revert run, log in, and look around using normal tools. Right? I edit some files and see what their contents are. That's very convenient. But it's not very trustworthy because I'm using the guest operating system's abstractions. I'm also trusting the results that they give me. And if they give me the wrong results, I'll get the wrong impression. To counter that, you could create an analysis tool that occurs that runs from outside the virtual machine and looks at the virtual hardware state. It looks at the virtual machine's registers, memory, and disk. That's very powerful in terms of it allows you to, to work even though you don't trust the guest operating system. But it's not very convenient. And this is just an example of the classic usability security trade-off. Right? You either have um, expressiveness and abstractions, or you have uh, um, better trust. Okay. Um, one type of tool you might imagine using is a debugger. Right? Debuggers are good at looking at bits and stuff like that and translating them sim symbolically and manipulating states. So we can think about using a debugger. And we've done that. We've integrated Revert with a debugger. Debuggers give you some nice things, right? You can manipulate state. You, you can examine it symbolically. Um, there's no Heisenberg effect because you're not actually changing things. You're just looking from the outside. There's no probe effect. Um, and you can control the execution of the, of the target system through normal things like breakpoints and stuff like that. Okay. Um, now, if you take that and combine it with Revert, you get some interesting results. Because Revert gives you these new capabilities. 
you can recreate any prior state, and you can replay any portion of a prior run. Now, what do you get when you combine these two things? Is you get um, the illusion, or you can provide the illusion of reverse debugging. Right? Debugging in reverse is kind of what programmers would, would like to do, I surmise. Right? Uh, let's say you have a uh, pointer that's gone bad. Um, now, normal debuggers give you things like forward watch points, which can tell you the next time a variable changes. Well, that doesn't do you much good if the pointer's bad, right? What you really want to know is, looking backwards, when's the last time the pointer changed? Okay. Now, you can do that with normal debugging. What you have to do is you have to rerun the whole run. Um, and if there's any non-determinism, you, know, you might not get to the same place, certainly not at the same time. But with revert, we can do that deterministically and guarantee you'll get to the same place and we use that to give the illusion of reverse debugging. So we can say, take me back to the last time something happened. And uh, I'm going to show you a, a demo of that also. All right. So um, this is, again, um, running on the box in there. This is a console. Okay, the same thing you saw as a black screen last time. This is a console. I realize you can't see it. Uh, you don't have to really see it. Um, I'll try to guide you through some of it. Um, so this is my Linux inside the virtual machines console. It's crashed. Okay? It's crashed because there's a bug, which, which was not our bug, but it was a bug that we found, or that somebody else had found. And um, I've attached a debugger, and that's this window here. So this window is the debugger attached to the virtual machine that's running in this console. Um, now, the virtual machine at this point has panicked. That is, the, um, the guest operating system, the operating system running inside the virtual machine, has called panic. And that's where we are right, right now. So you can see we're, we're in the panic routine of the, of the kernel. Uh, and now we like to say, well, how do we get here? Okay. Now, normal GDB and debuggers give you this. You can just do a backtrace of the stack. So we're going to do that. And that's really a crude form of time travel, of re going in reverse, if you think about it, right? We're just going up to the last invocation. But it's rather crude, because you only get the local variables, and you only get at the time of the last invocation, and there's lots of other data that you don't get. But we'll use it as we can. So we'll go up, and panic was called by um, a function called relay signal, and I'm sorry it's so small, but I had to fit a lot on. Um, it was called by a function called relay signal, and relay signal called panic because of this macro, and all you have to know is that macro asserted, that is called panic, because a member of the struct regs, which was called scas is user, was zero. Okay? So a member scas is user was zero, and apparently the system did not expect that, so it called panic. Now let's see how that happened. We'll go up in the stack frame again. This is just normal GDB, no revert, no nothing, just normal stuff. Um, it comes from a kind of a nothing function. And we'll go up one more time. And now it gets interesting. So this is where we were that eventually called the function I called panic. And if you'll see, right up here, um, I had just set reg scas is user to 1, which is what I expected it to be down here. Right? So I set it to 1. I checked to make sure it was 1 and, and 0. Okay? Kind of mysterious. And you'll have to take my word for it that no code in here changes reg scas is user. Okay? Now, there's a number of things that could have happened. Any, any ideas, by the way, about uh, if Matt, you were debugging this? I mean, what, what would you think had happened? Okay, so maybe a memory uh, wild pointer got uh, overwrote scas user. That's possible. Another thread. Another thread. Some kind of interrupt, right? Yeah, both those things are quite possible. And we really don't know which. But with reverse debugging, we can very easily uh, solve this. All we have to do is set a watch point on the variable that we want. Right? So I set a watch point. It's a hardware watch point, in case you're wondering. A watch point on that variable, and I say, take me back to the last time that that got modified from, from the panic point. Okay? So I set a watch point, and I say, please bring me back to the, the last time before the current point that that variable was modified. And you'll see this thing um, executing. It's actually not really going backwards. It just looks like it's going backwards. This is actually executing forward a couple times to figure out where it wants to bring you to. All right, we can't actually reverse, do true reverse execution. Uh, and it brings us back to this point in a function called sig handler common scads, which is um, user mode Linux's interrupt routine. Right? So Jim is right, essentially. And, and another interrupt happened. Um, I was actually already in an interrupt routine. And the, the bug here was that another interrupt happened, nested interrupt. And I changed this mode variable, which is what this is, and I forgot to save it and restore it to the right value. Very easy to debug with reverse debugging. But if you've ever debugged you know, memory stomping and, and race conditions, you, you know that they're not that easy to debug, but it's trivial um, with reverse debugging for this case. All right. 
What happened? <laughs> Oh, I had it. That wasn't in slide mode. That's what it is. Okay, there we go. Now we go. All right. Um, so due to time, I'm going to skip over this. Yes. Oh, absolutely. In fact, we have a user's paper coming out on debugging operating systems with this stuff. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, yes, forensics and debugging are really are really two sides of the same coin. You're, you're, in forensics, you're debugging against somebody bad. And in normal debugging, you're debugging against yourself or some, or some coder, right? <laughs> Hopefully not evil. You may, be, you may be bad, but you may not be evil. You're not, that's, that's right. That's right. I'm not sure which is worse. I guess malicious must be worse. You can have malicious and incompetent, right? That's, that's called script kitty. All right. Um, so, you know, if you think about forensic analysis tools, in general, what, what you really want to do is um, you want to provide something that um, presents information in an easier to consume manner to a system admin, or even a user, perhaps, or another tool. And so you want to filter out unused information, not needed information. And you also want to present higher level of abstraction to see what happened. And we developed a tool called Backtracker, which actually runs with or without revert. Um, Backtracker, um, its aim is to provide this kind of higher level of abstraction. And it's trying to answer a very specific question, which is, please highlight which application was exploited. So the idea is, you discover the exploit because you see something on your machine that's not right. right? Some process is running, some file has changed, it crashes, some, something in your machine is not right. We want to be, give you a tool that will take that starting point and automatically tell you um, what happened before so that you can quickly narrow down which, which application was exploited. I'm, I'm not going to tell you how we do it. You can read our SOSP paper uh, about, about it. But here's, here's a, uh, a sample result. Um, we discovered a process called ptrace running on our system. Uh, this is on a honeypot. We say, hey, that's not supposed to be there. It was doing some bad stuff. So we say, please, uh, you know, we gave this to Backtracker and said, how did that get there? And out came this graph, uh, except for the legend. And um, <coughs> uh, what happened was ptrace came from this process. This process came from this executable called slash temp slash exploit slash ptrace, uh, which was kind of suspicious. Uh, and that came from a tarball, which came over the internet from a socket. And that came from some shell, which came from uh, HTTPD, which is Apache. Uh, and that's kind of suspicious. Uh, Apache doesn't normally launch bash shells, especially ones that download executables, especially ones that are named slash temp slash exploit. Um, so that was our bug right there, or that was our application that was, that was highlighted as suspicious was um, Apache. Okay. And this was all automatic. Um, here's a version for Windows. Um, um, we're, this is very recent work. Um, Jay Lorch has been helping us with the vTrace tool that we used to, um, to get some of this information. And uh, we discovered this uh, process running um, something called iExplorer, which is not actually Internet Explorer, but is a cleverly named uh, program to try to fool the admins. Um, that came from a process um, here, which came from this binary. Um, that binary was downloaded using TFTP, which seems to be the, uh, a tool of choice by, by Black Hats. And this whole thing was started from SVC host, which I believe is the RPC daemon on Windows. Um, and that was, our, that was our buggy application as well. Okay. This is Windows 2000. No doubt it's been patched by now. Okay. That's Backtracker. And again, I apologize. I'm not going to cover any more details about how that works. But uh, the, the two basic techniques are causality and filtering. Now, this last part is uh, about two-thirds baked. So uh, I wanted to present some, some recent stuff. Um, but please bear with me in terms of uh, you know, some of this not quite ready for, for prime time. We're, still, we're just submitting a paper now on it, or hopefully soon. Um, and what we're trying to attack is this fourth problem, the fourth problem being undetected intrusions. Now, to, to understand this, let's walk through the lifetime of, of how a bug comes and goes on your system. Okay? You're running your system along, and uh, it's fine. You install some software, or you upgrade some software or something, and it's got a bug in it, a vulnerability. Now your system is vulnerable. But you don't know it, of course. Otherwise, presumably, you wouldn't do that. Then you keep running, and at some point later, uh, somebody discovers the bug and releases a patch for it. And hopefully those two are closely related in time. But ideally, right, they're closely related in time. So a patch is released. Now you're a system administrator. And you say, OK, I, you know, I have a bug in my system. 
what do you do? So what, what thoughts would go through your head and what actions would you take um, when this happens? Surely this happens to you, right? System updater or says, you know, please install critical patches, right? SP2 has been released or something like that, right? I just had a whole bunch of patches for, for my Windows system, actually, a couple days ago. So what do you do in this case? You say OK, and you hope for the best. OK. All right. Surprisingly, um, well, of course, there are a lot of careless users who don't do that. Um, but actually, people who care about reliability don't do that. Because it's not good enough to hope for the best for them. What they do is they say, you give me a patch, I need to test it. Right? So actually, they won't install the patch right away, people who care about reliability. And this is a well-documented um, um, phenomenon. They will wait for a while, do some of their own testing on their own system before deploying it in production. Okay, so actually, you don't deploy it right away. You actually keep running vulnerable. Okay? And uh, eventually, you do apply the patch, and then uh, you're good to go again. Okay? Now, the problem here, there's really two phases of the problem. One is you're running here vulnerable with a vulnerability that you know about, and yet you're still running with it because you have to. You just don't have the option of taking the machine down right away and rebooting it or whatever, right? Because you have a critical application that needs to, get, needs to keep running. Um, second is, I wonder if any of you had the thought when I asked that question, um, you know, I've been running this software for months now, and it's been vulnerable the whole time. We just found out about it now. But maybe somebody else found out about it before us. Quite possible, right? Likely, in fact. Right? <laughs> well, depending on how pessimistic you are and how smart you think the bad guys are. But, it's quite possible they found out about the attack before us. So what do you do about this stuff here? And can you do anything about that time frame there? And that's the goal of my current project. Um, did somebody, I want to answer, did somebody exploit this vulnerability in the past? And can I do anything about here before I'm willing to install the patch? Can I still protect myself without trusting the patch? Okay. And I think the answer is yes to both. We're going to use um, vulnerability-specific predicates. This is very, if you're familiar with the shield stuff that Helen has done, um, this is very similar to shield, except it's not network centric. Okay. We're going to detect, in fact, we were somewhat inspired by, anyway, so, anyway. Um, so we're going to detect, detect intrusions on known bugs using vulnerability specific predicates. Right? And you can imagine how you can do a good job with this, be very accurate, because you know about the bug. So it's not too hard to detect it, right? Um, and that's going to help us in two ways. One, um, it'll help us because over the prior execution, if we combine this with revert, we can go back, re-execute the past execution, monitor it using this predicate, and tell you whether you've had that vulnerability exploited in the past. Right? Um, that's very useful, I think. Um, second is, in the, um, before you're willing to install a patch, you can install a predicate. Now you might say, yeah, if I don't trust a patch, why do I going to trust your predicate? And the reason is, um, the predicate will not perturb your system. Okay, it's a policy you can dial, dial around to say, um, I'm going to just get alerted if the, if the vulnerability gets exploited, or I'm going to maybe take some corrective action. I'm going to drop the connection, kill the process, halt the machine. That's all configurable. You can perturb if you want. But you can evaluate the predicate without perturbing the system at all, if, also if you want. Okay? And that's going to allow you to install the predicate automatically without even testing it. Yes, it's exactly the same concept as shield for this part, right? That's exactly right. This is shield in retroactive, right? Except that um, our idea here is not to use network, um, network filters or network um, state machines to understand this, this stuff. We're going to put it in the code itself. And I can talk about it with you about the trade-offs between the two things there. But the basic idea is that shield has to maintain some state, as I understand it, so you have to maintain some state. And for certain bugs, that might be a lot of, you might have to actually mirror the, the actions of the application in the worst case. And I don't want to have to put that in the shield. I want to put that in the application because it's already there. That's the basic trade-off. Right? The, the other side is that this is going to be somewhat more invasive, um, although I, I guess shield is also host-based in some ways. So, yeah, so. You can imagine a network-based shield, I suppose, if it, was, if it didn't use any application encryption or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I can well believe that. How do you revert in any sort of reasonable time frame without implementing your patch release patch patch find situation? Mm -hmm. Well, 
So the predicate will, can only identify whether it's been triggered at this point. It can't actually, of course, this is the past. You, we can't, the past is immutable, no, right? Uh, <laughs> some science fiction story here somewhere. <laughs> yes. What you're observing is that this is a very hard problem because this could be a long time frame. And I, I totally agree with you, right? So it's possible you're not going to cover this whole time frame. This could be five years, <laughs> right? Um, and we can replay it faster than, because your system is usually idle, you know, on most systems. We can compress five years into maybe three months or something like that. Um, but still, that's a long period of time. And so it's possible you won't be able to cover it all. But we'd like to cover as much as we can. Right? I think just because we can't cover it all doesn't mean we shouldn't cover some. Right? I'm not saying it's that idea. I'm just wondering if you've done any work to help feed that process. Um, well, our predicate evaluation, which I'll talk about in a sec, our predicate evaluation is pretty fast. It adds a little overhead. And then the replay, because it squeezes out idle time, again, can occur quite a bit faster than real time. But you still have the fundamental problem. If you have a system that's pegged over a long period of time, to replay that, it's going to take a long time. And um, we can evaluate multiple predicates at the same time, though. So you know, if you have a kind of a rolling admissions and you're evaluating the last few months, you, know, you can, again, install predicates and do kind of dual duty at once. Yeah, Jim? Uh, only if the exploit's effects were res had residual effects. So if the exploit came in, did something bad, and then left, and you can't tell, uh, then you can't use binary search. Yeah, the predicates, that's right. The predicates are looking at the triggering of the bug. Jim's saying, instead of looking at the triggering, which is an event, can you look at the ongoing state, which is an interval? Reading confidential data. So yeah, I want to know if they stole my credit card. Although I actually, I probably know already if they stole my credit card because they ordered. A, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I had a fifteen hundred dollar bill for T-shirts on my credit card once. And I didn't order all those T-shirts. All right. Um, so that's the that's the idea with with this system. The system's uh, actually one more slide. Um, here's an example of a predicate. By what I mean by a predicate, this is the vulnerable. This is the buggy code here. It's very simple. All it does is copy a buffer, a, a string to a buffer. The the bug is that you forgot to check so that the buffer fits in there. Um, you know, we made up this vulnerability, but it's not too far off from realistic vulnerabilities. Um, um, the, the predicate's really simple. The predicate is uh, you look at this line of code, and you see if the uh, string is too long. Right? Trivial. This is just an illustrative example. Um, and you can do this with breakpoints. You can say, stop it here, um, and look at the length, and see if it's too long. Right? Um, now, there is a lot more challenging examples, which I want to get to, but this is just to illustrate what I mean by a predicate. The system that we have to do this is called Introvert, uh, you know, along our naming theme here. Uh, we still have a few products left in the pipeline. Uh, we haven't come up with ideas. We have names, you know, in invert, convert, subvert. Um, so what we have is we have the virtual machine here running or rerunning, and we have an introspection engine sitting alongside here looking at it, evaluating predicates, controlling it. Um, you put predicates into the box, they get installed, okay? and what the result of the VM introspection engine is, is you get things like um, you, had an, you had an intrusion at this point, or at least the vulnerability was triggered at this point. Okay? You can configure this if you're running after the patches, if you're running live instead of replaying. You can configure this also to say stop your system if you're really conservative, and then you know, hey, I better accelerate patch uh, testing. Uh, or you can kill the connection or kill the process. It, that's very flexible. Um, that's what you mean by introvert. Uh, so here's a, another vulnerability, which is uh, quite a bit harder. So let's say you, you look at the, you know, who the user is, and then you perform some privileged action. And what you should do is you should check to make sure the user is allowed to perform the privileged action. Maybe there's some membership file that it needs to check, right? And you forget to check that. That's your bug. Okay? Now, um, what would a predicate have to do to evaluate this bug, to see this bug? Well, it's going to have to read the membership file and, um, and see if you're allowed to execute this or not. Right? Now, uh, that sounds simple enough. But what does it mean for the predicate to evaluate, uh, to read the file? It's going to have to look on disk to read the file. Now, the, the introspection engine knows nothing about file systems. It knows about disk blocks. It's a virtual machine layer tool. We can encode in it the ability to parse through NTFS or XT3 or whatever to understand the file system structure. We could do that. 
That's going to make the, tool, the predicate rather hairy, though. It's got to understand file systems. And what if the most recent version of the file is in the file cache? Oh, now we have to understand the file cache structure of the operating system. We probably have to look at locks. and I mean, it's, it's just a big, hairy mess. I don't want to have to put that much in the predicate. So how can we do this? Um, right, we don't want to have to understand the whole file system. Um, now, the way to solve this is to observe that the code to understand this, the raw state of the machine is already there. It's in the virtual machine software. Right? It's, it's in the guest operating system software. It already understands the file system. It already understands the file cache and all that locking structure and stuff. Right? So you already have code that can allow you to read that file. It's in the guest. It's in the virtual machine. So we can just call that code. Say, OK, predicate calls the code to say, read the group file for me and tell me if, and then I read it and I see if you're in the right membership. Okay? But that leads to another problem. If you call guest code, you're perturbing guest state. And I want it to not perturb the thing at all. Right? For one thing, in replay, if you perturb things, my little inductive proof doesn't work anymore. For another thing, if you're in live mode and you're perturbing the system, what makes you think I'm going to trust your predicate to perturb the system in the right way? Right? What if it deletes Etsy group instead of looking at Etsy group? Right? Um, so we actually have an idea how to solve it. It's not complicated. You just take a checkpoint before you do your predicate and restore after the predicate's done. Very simple idea. And we have a very fast checkpointing mechanism um, that's been implemented to do this. It doesn't slow you down very much. Okay. Um, the state of the system is it's, it's working. We have um, kernel predicates tested, and um, it works just fine. Adds, uh, I don't know, six, five, six percent overhead. Um, and uh, we're working on it for user applications as well. Okay. That's what, and we're working on the paper. So I hope I've convinced you, uh, kind of a whirlwind tour, that virtual machines are useful. Um, if you weren't convinced already. Uh, I, I talked about several tools, revert, uh, combining revert with GDB, a de debugger to get reverse debugging, um, Backtracker, which I realized I went over very quickly. Um, and we have other tools as well that, that are also operate at the level of Backtracker to try to understand intrusions, as well as some recent work on introvert, which detects intrusions through virtual machine introspection and perturbation-free predicates. That's all. I'm happy to take questions, um, either here or Later offline. Helen? So um, predicates are not dangerous per se, but they may not be applicable. And I think the answer is really it says you need as many predicates as patches. Because a predicate is, is somewhat of a simplified patch. Right? You're not fixing the problem, you're just detecting the problem. But logically, the same information is encoded in there. Um, so yeah, if you have a patch per system, then you need a predicate per system. Right? But I don't think you actually need a patch per system. Um, I mean, the patch is specific to a so piece of software. Yeah. So you might have a patch per version of the software, but not per system. Right. So how does the predicate get written? Um, we're, so there's different models for this. We're assuming that the um, patch writer, who already understands the bug, presumably, hopefully, We'll write the predicate at the same time. And the knowledge you need to write the predicate is actually, um, it's actually easier than writing a patch, in our experience. Actually, we're saved because you know, a, lot of, a lot of vulnerabilities are just really, really simple. So the predicates are really, really simple, too. Have you ever been able to generate predicates from the patch? Yeah, we thought about that. There's been some work in the, in the programming languages community on, on, on that, um, like um, Michael Hicks, I think, in a PLDI a couple of years ago, um, on looking at dynamic patching and, and creating those automatically. Uh, we thought about doing that. We're not language people, although we have one at Michigan that we're working with. But um, I thought about doing that in a way by like um, running the patch software and the non-patch software and comparing the two. And when the two differ, that's your predicate. Um, but that's you know the problem is there's non-determinism there to compare. There's Byzantine uh, you know it's kind of like Byzantine fault tolerance, which I think you guys know something about here. Um, you know you have to worry about transforming the state and doing a fancy diff. Uh, yeah. So. Um, I actually would be interested, if you have ideas about how to, how to do automatic generation of predicates, I'd be, I'd be interested. Because, um, uh, that's okay. They already have the exploit. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, yeah, as far as we know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. As far as we know. 
No, I, so I'm, not, I'm not trying to just be uh, sarcastic here. So um, what I'm observing is that um, we're measuring that by numbers. We're saying most systems get attacked after the patch is released. And so I believe you. I think you're probably right. But I'll just observe that there are an unknown number of um, maybe more targeted attacks. This is kind of, a, if you subscribe to conspiracy theory in the world, um, there might be some stealth attacks that precede the patch. Oh, oh, yeah. Right, right. Uh, that's true, and, and I guess that, that, you know, that has to do with the kind of long-standing, uh, you know, argument of, you know, how much information to release during the patch, and, you know, we're making it easier for the bad guys, we're making things better for the good guys, you know, is it differentially better, and, yeah, and, and uh, I'm just trying to build tools, and and, <laughs> and uh, I, you know I hope the good guys are not, hopefully the bad guys are not reading SOSP and OSDI. Uh, they probably are. You know, but. Other questions? All right. Thanks. Thank you very much.